Hello and welcome. So today we're going to be giving you all a simulated entry level cybersecurity technical interview. What actually prompted me to make this video is I looked up mock interviews, mock technical interviews, and a lot of them were about interviews that were already happening between two other people, right? I find that the best way to practice for interviews is by interviewing, right? So the purpose of this video today is going to be for you all to have me act as your interviewer, hence the blazer. Uh, and as I ask a question, you're going to be able to pause the video, answer it how you would in an actual interview. And then at the end of the interview, I'm going to go through the answers that I would suggest for each question, right? So this is to give you all as much practice as possible. So in terms of how the format of this video will go, I am going to ask you all a question as your interviewer. I want you all to obviously practice good interview etiquette, right? Look at the webcam like I'm looking at right now as you answer. Uh, I want you all to make sure that you have open body language, that you are speaking as clearly as possible with no fillers, if possible. Obviously, there will be some here and there, and I do them also as well. And the way it's going to work is once I ask a question, I want you to pause the video, take time answering that question, and then you could unpause, and I'm going to move through to the next question as if it was an actual interviewer. Now, keep in mind that at the end of the video, once again, I'm going to be giving some of the answers that I would have been given or that I would have given that I would have been given that I, I would give if I was in your shoes. Interview starts now. So how would you explain the CIA triad to a non-technical individual? Now, this is the only time I'm going to remind you, but pause the video, answer the question to the best of your ability, and then unpause and I will ask the next question. Explain cross-site scripting and how to prevent it. Following up on the last question, are there any other attacks that could actually be prevented using those same methods? Pivoting into a different family of attacks, explain the botnet and what it might be used for. How would you go about securing a physical data center, right? So picture a server room with physical servers. How would you secure that room? Explain the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. What is the reason why a company might be aware of their vulnerabilities or aware of certain cybersecurity vulnerabilities, but still choose not to fix them? Who's more dangerous to an organization, an insider or an outsider? What is the difference between a threat, a vulnerability and a risk? Which of the three is the most secure? SSL, TLS or HTTPS? Now we're going to move over to the answer portion of this video. I'm going to tell you all the answers I would have given if I was asked these questions. So for the first one, where it was asking, how would you explain the CIA triad to a non-technical individual? There's a couple things that this question is really asking. The first question is, do you know what the acronym CIA stands for? The second thing this question is really trying to prod at is, is this person, is the person that we're interviewing, able to take technical concepts and to break them down and communicate them into bite-sized chunks, right? So this question is actually going to be testing for not just your technical skills and knowledge, but also for your ability to communicate this to perhaps a non-technical interview or excuse me, non-technical uh, personnel, right? Fields where this is very relevant. If you are going to be any type of consulting, it is very important to be able to explain technical concepts to non-technical individuals. Now to the actual answer instead of the meta question and answer. So how would you explain the CIA triad to a non-technical individual? Well, to start off, the CIA triad stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In a way that I like to explain that concept is usually using the concept of sending a letter. So confidentiality, for example, right in this interaction, is let's say I sent a letter to you. Confidentiality is making sure that nobody picks up our letter in the middle and reads the contents of our secret message, right? So plainly speaking, confidentiality is all about making sure that only the people who are supposed to see the contents or the information see it, right? So making sure that the information that's meant to stay secret, stays secret. Integrity, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Imagine in the same scenario, I mail you a letter, right? Somebody picks up that letter in the middle and instead of reading the contents, Right, what they do is they actually take a pencil and they change the letter I wrote to you. That's going to threaten the integrity of the letter. Right, so the piece of integrity or the integrity piece of this triad is actually saying that we need to make sure that the contents are not modified by an unauthorized source. This could play into effect in a lot of ways. The main way is just 
making sure that what I meant to send you in the letter has not been modified or changed in a way that is no longer representative of the message I was actually trying to convey to you. The way this would look in a real life example, right, is let's say you have a passwords database. The making sure the integrity of that database is secured is just about making sure that those passwords don't get changed by an unauthorized source. Now, last up is availability, right? And availability is all about making sure that information is accessible when you need it to be. The most common way to think about this is if I go to facebook.com and if that website is down and I can't reach it, it's unavailable, right? It's inaccessible to me. So availability is just playing on the accessibility piece, right? So the A, the availability piece is just saying, as long as this information is up and accessible to other people, then it is available, right? So that is the CIA triad, basically answered through two different scenarios. One is sending a letter and the other is going to a common website that we've been to before. This answer is to the question, what is cross-site scripting and what are some of the methods to prevent it? So at a very baseline understanding and explanation of cross-site scripting, it's basically just when you inject code into a web application that's vulnerable, and this code is going to make an otherwise benign or harmless website attack a client, right? So basically, what does this look like? Let's say I use facebook.com and I inject some code to make it so that everyone who goes to Facebook has this pop-up that says, call this number right away, right? That's an example of cross-site scripting. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm putting malicious code, usually JavaScript, into an input field. And now every person who goes to that, that website may be subjected to it, right? They might see that pop up, right? They might be attacked. There's a couple different types of cross-site scripting. The one I just explained is called stored. It's when you're actually storing code onto the server. There's also a way to use cross-site scripting to actually manipulate URLs and to make that as part of your attack too. Let's say instead of needing you to go to a website and click on that page and all that, uh, I, I actually could just forge a URL that will make the website have unexpected behavior. What can cross-site scripting accomplish? It could either make pop-ups come up, it could redirect users to different sites, it could steal session cookies, and it could do a whole lot of other things as well. A lot of times it's just limited to the creativity of the at attacker at that point. Now, when it gets into ways to prevent it, there are quite a few, right? And a lot of it comes down to honestly, just being very cognizant when these applications are being programmed. The first is using uh, input sanitation and uh, input validation. What do I mean by that? Well, when you have a username or login, or excuse me, a username and a password field, or really any input field that takes in any sort of input from the user, you need to make sure that the user is giving what we call expected input, right? Let's say I have a username field on a website. I don't want someone to be able to put malicious code into that username that might be used to victimize others. So what I need to do is I need to either ban specific characters that I know could be indicative of code, or I need to make sure that whatever input that person puts in is read very literally. It's read as you know a string and there's no way for it to be interpreted, right? So that's when we get to input sanitation and validation being that we just make sure that whatever input is given by users is not malicious. We also have on the back end, right? So this is more in terms of how we deal with the input on the back end and how we deal with the queries itself, we should be using parameterized queries. Parameterized query is basically just making it so that the values that the user passes us are only provided at the time of execution, which would actually nullify this attack as well. An important thing to note is when it comes to cross-site scripting attacks, a lot of times they're misconstrued as server-side, which means they're attacking a server or a database in some way. In actuality, most of the time, they're actually a client-side attack. Now, you might have malicious code that's stored on, let's say, Facebook server, but it might not actually attack the servers themselves. It might just be using Facebook servers to serve that attack to other people. The next question was, what other attacks could be prevented with the same methods? Well, SQL injection. SQL injection actually functions very similarly to cross-site scripting. It's about injecting code into an input field that isn't expecting code, right? And in the same way that cross-site scripting does it in a lot of different forms of cross-site scripting, SQL injection actually has a very similar attack pattern. The main difference between the two is the type of code that's being injected. With cross-site scripting, it's usually JavaScript that's meant to attack the user. SQL injection attacks, on the other hand, actually are trying to attack the servers themselves, right? You're putting SQL code, which is a databasing language, into that input field and attacking the servers. The way to prevent it, as we talked about before, 
Input, sanitation, and validation, right, are going to be two keys. A lot of times with SQL injection, it's all about making sure specific characters are banned, such as dashes, such as percent signs, right? Anything that can be commonly used within the language itself, we want to make sure is banned and not allowed to be used uh, in the username or password input fields. The question after that was, what is a botnet and what can it be used for? Botnets are actually a co collection of computers that are usually under the control of an individual, a hacker in this case. And what happens is when you have a collection of computers, if you're this a hacker, you could actually use it to amplify the power of your attacks. So let's start off with a certain type of attack, a DOS attack, a DOS attack. That stands for denial of service. A DOS attack is when one computer sends a bunch of requests to another computer, hoping to bring that computer down by flooding it with requests. All right, DOS attacks can only be so strong because they're typically coming from one machine. However, if you have a botnet, which is a collection of machines you own, right, a collection of machines, and by own, I mean have control over, right, could be other people's machines technically, right, a co collection of machines that you have control over, you could actually amplify your attack. Instead of sending requests from just one machine to the other, we could send it from a, a list of machines, multiple machines, to make it so that we have more requests going in and that we have a higher chance of actually bringing down our target server. Now, how are botnets created? Typically, they're created by spreading worms, some sort of malware that actually give you control over other people's computers. Um, there's actually a couple famous examples of them that escape the, the top of my mind right now. But keep in mind that when it comes to botnets, it's typically a hacker that has control over a lot of other people's computers and then uses them to perform their attacks. This is also part of the reason why retaliation, right? Retaliation hacking is typically illegal, specifically in the States where I'm located. And the reason for that is a lot of times, let's say you get attacked by a DDoS attack. It's very rare that the computers attacking you are actually the systems of the hacker themselves. It's either a proxy server or it's somebody else that they took control of their computers and are just using it as part of the mechanism of their attack. Attention everybody, I'd like to propose a toast to continuity errors. The next question was, how do you secure a physical data center? Now, obviously, there's a lot of ways to go about this, right? A lot of different angles to approach that. The way I would approach it in an interview would be to go outwards and then move your way inwards, right? So at a very baseline level, right? The best way to secure a physical server room probably is going to have some sort of lock structure, right? And maybe even CCTVs outside of the room, right? Just so that you have some trail of accountability. When it comes to the lock on the door, right, you could obviously say, you know, you want a standard lock, maybe you want a biometrics lock, right, a lot of different routes you could go. In addition to that, another good way to secure a, a data center or specifically your server room uh, is to make sure that you have security guards around, right, and assuming cost isn't an issue, make sure that you have different fire safeties in place as well. A lot of times server rooms can generate a lot of heat and fires can actually be uh, pretty common. So because of that, you want to make sure you have uh, a lot of different safeties in places, uh, or a lot of different safeties in place, not just for, you know, the case of a malicious actor trying to get in, uh, but also for natural disasters, like, you know, a fire just combusting in the fire or the server room. Outside of that, you, you're going to want to make sure that you have a very robust structure when it comes to who is allowed in and out of the rooms, right? You know, do you want to give your intern of one week a key to the server room and the ability to unplug all the servers if they wanted to? Uh, probably not. Right. So you're going to need some sort of uh, privilege access management system, right? Some sort of way to actually uh, not only just authenticate people, but also figure out authorization, you know, who is and is not allowed into this room. Uh, and if you want to go very far out, right, let's say the interviewers then you just, you know, talk on and on about this, which obviously you don't want to do unpromptedly. Uh, but you could say that you would secure the entire facility with things like man traps, right? They're actually these basically turnstiles that are making sure that nobody can just come in behind you, right? You enter a building, a lot of times people will prop the door open behind them. A man trap actually prevents that. It's like a turnstile. I like to think of it like uh, the subway turnstiles. Uh, bullards are another great way to protect the facility. These will actually prevent cars from, you know, just crashing into the walls, you know, but obviously most companies, most businesses probably don't need those. Uh, and outside of that, you know, as you could probably tell, there are a lot of different physical measures, right? So this question is really just, trying to see your thought process in, in securing the facility from a holistic perspective. A lot of times, as cybersecurity people, we get very uh, mixed up in the technical and we don't always think so much in terms of the physical and, and what we can actually do uh, to use that to assist 
you know, the security of our networks and the security of our infrastructure. If your interviewer asks about the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption, and they're not asking you about specific examples, right, this is actually a pretty straightforward question and can be a bit intuitive as well. Symmetric encryption means you have symmetrical keys, right? So the key that is used to lock the door is the same one that's used to unlock the door. Hence the symmetry, right? They're, they're copies. When it comes to asymmetrical encryption, it's actually a little bit more complicated. The key that locks the door is a different key than the one that unlocks the door, right? And now obviously this is a bit of a confusing concept because there really aren't a lot of real life examples of having one key to lock and another key to unlock, right? But just keep in mind with asymmetric encryption, the main difference between it and symmetric is going to be the fact that you have to use different keys. Now, if you wanna go a little bit deeper between these differences, there's going to be something that you have to be very understanding of. With asymmetric encryption, you are going to need two different keys, right? You're going to need to set up some sort of infrastructure in which you have a public key, which is available to everyone, and a private key, right? That's just how asymmetric goes. Symmetrical keys, on the other hand, are going to be you and one other person have the same key, right? There's no difference between the two keys you have. One difficulty with symmetric encryption that you don't face with asymmetric encryption is key distribution. Because of the fact that I need to share my key, let's say with, you know, Tony across the hall, because of the fact that, you know, I need to, I only have one type of key and I need to share it with Tony, there can be a lot of risks to me sending it out, right? And let's say emailing it to Tony, right? There's a lot of risk that someone could catch it in the middle or Tony's email gets hacked and then they get the key. Right, so keep in mind with symmetric encryption, key distribution is a bit of a fear. The reason why that isn't a fear with asymmetric encryption, when you have a public key and a private key, is because the private key is something I keep to myself always. The public key, on the other hand, is something that everyone else can have, right? Now, obviously, we could go much deeper into, you know, why do we do this public-private key infrastructure, right? But for the purposes of just answering this question, right, the main difference between symmetric and asymmetric Symmetric, same key, used to lock and unlock the door. Asymmetric, uses different keys to lock and unlock. And then also maybe want to throw in, right, once again, that symmetric encryption is going to have that difficulty with key distribution, whereas asymmetric typically does not. Why would a company know what their vulnerabilities are, but choose not to fix them? The easiest way to answer this question is cost. There are some vulnerabilities that are just not cost effective when it comes to fixing them. For example, it may be considered a vulnerability that your broom room, right? You know, you have a room that has brooms in it, right? It might be considered a vulnerability that that is unlocked and somebody could steal that and run away with it, right? But it may cost more to secure that room than it does to actually have that happen. What does this look like in a cybersecurity context, right? Let's say you have a low impact vulnerability on a system that is low privilege and isn't very critical. It might actually cause you or cost you more to spend the resources to fix that issue than it would to just accept the risk, right? So this is where we get into a conversation about risk tolerance. Certain businesses will have a, a threshold of risk tolerance that they're willing to take. And usually what it comes down to, the way they calculate that, is based off of monetary purposes, right? What is the cost of securing that? And does that cost of securing it outweigh the cost of the damage if something was to occur? right? The, uh, the real way they calculate it, it, it's usually a calculation of impact and likelihood, right? They throw those two things together and then we're able to try to figure out and, you know, propose a financial risk that is associated with specific issues. This obviously becomes more complicated when you're talking about, let's say, critical information. There really isn't an easy way to uh, quantify how much money is worth, you know, keeping, let's say, credit card information safe because that will not only come at the risk of lawsuits, but it can also come at the risk of your, you know, basically the, the public facing aspects of your business, right? So just keep in mind that with this question, it can get a little bit tricky uh, to quantify that. Which is more dangerous to an organization, an insider or an outsider? The main way I'd approach it is I'd say, honestly, it, it depends on the context, right? Now, it, it may feel unintuitive to answer a question, you know, by choosing both sides. But when it comes to a question as open-ended as what's more dangerous to an organization, insider or outsider, it is important to show that you understand that it's going to depend on a couple factors. 
right? So the way I'd answer this question is honestly, it depends, right? If the insider is, let's say, an intern with low level privileges, right? And they really can't do a lot of damage. I would say that that intern, that insider is probably less of a threat to us than an APT, an advanced persistent threat that is dedicated to taking our servers down, right? Now, when it comes to who has an easy, easier time getting into the system, it's probably still going to be the intern. But when it comes to the question of who is a greater risk to an organization or who's a greater threat, right, insider or outsider, it's really all going to come down to the specific individuals. On the whole, right, in most cases, insiders will be more of a threat than outsiders to your organization. Although we have specified that in some cases that isn't true. Um, on the whole, right, it's more likely the case that somebody inside your organization is more of a threat because of the fact that they already have some sort of preliminary access. Whether it's an intern who does damage accidentally, whether it's a disgruntled worker that does damage purposely, right, just the fact that they have that initial access is a significant factor. However, the thing to keep in mind with outsiders is that typically if an outsider is trying to break in, it is almost guaranteed that there is malicious intent to it. Right. And because of that, it is very important to understand that the intent will usually coincide with the amount of effort somebody puts into it. Right. How much effort is an intern going to put into unintentionally making mistakes? Probably not a lot. It's probably not a conscious thing they're doing, hopefully. Uh, but an APT, an advanced persistent threat, a nation state threat, a hacktivist, right, all of those different outsiders could potentially put a lot of time, resources, and also skill sets into their particular attacks. The next question was, what is the difference between a threat, a vulnerability, and a risk? So just to start off, we'll, we'll begin with vulnerability. Vulnerabilities are referring to weaknesses in your system. For example, if you leave a window open, that is a vulnerability to your home. That doesn't mean a burglar is going to, you know, crawl into your window and break in and steal your stuff, right? But it's still a vulnerability because it's a weakness. A threat, on the other hand, a threat is the burglar. That is a, an entity or a thing, right, to leave it vague, that will exploit that vulnerability, right? So the window being open is the vulnerability. The threat is the burglar who will actually take advantage of that vulnerability, right, and, and to go into it. Now, risk, on the other hand, uh, risk is referring to the potential damages that can occur, right? So the, the risk of a burglar jumping into your window is that they could steal your assets. They could steal, let's say, your TVs, your valuables, your jewelry, cash, whatever it is, cats maybe, you know, whatever they want to take, right? That's the risk of it all, right? So once again, vulnerability, the weakness, window being open. Uh, the threat is the actual burglar going into your home. And then the risk is the things that the burglar will take. It is basically the amount that can be lost, damaged, destroyed, you know, by that threat exploiting that vulnerability. After that, the question was, which is the most secure, SSL, TLS, or HTTPS? This is actually a trick question, and it's not common to be asked trick questions, right? But it is possible. And what you have to do in these scenarios is basically you have to show that you understand the question's a bit of a trick while also answering it, you know, pretty delicately, right? So if someone asks you, which is most secure, SSL, TLS, or HTTPS, spoiler alert, the trick to the question is that HTTPS actually uses TLS SSL encryption, right? So when it comes down to answering the question, you got to be able to show that you have to show that you have an understanding that the question is inherently flawed and you know, a little bit misleading. So the way I would answer the question is by going like this, I would say, Hey, I know HTTPS uses TLS SSL encryption. So for that reason, it's, it's difficult for me to choose which is the most secure when HTTPS is a protocol that's using those other methods to encrypt itself, right? And, and that answer in and of itself, it's basically going to show the interviewer what they're looking for, which is that you are able to take a question that seems misleading, understand why it's misleading, and not just get pressured into choosing one of the three options given, right? And, you know, once again, it's a trick question. It's not common that this happens, but you should be prepared to ask follow-ups and to show that you have some understanding of why this question is a bit convoluted. Thank you all for watching. If you liked it, please hit that like button, subscribe button, whatever you want to do. Uh, I do plan on making more of these videos in the future. If you all tell me in the comments that you enjoy this format and think it's helpful for you. Uh, I also plan on making other cybersecurity related videos too. So if you're interested in those, stay tuned as well. Uh, but thank you for tuning in. I will see you all in the next video.